What if Grievous was with Dooku when he fought Obi-Wan and Anakin aboard the Invisible Hand? How would that change things? Let's find out. So in this alternate Star Wars timeline, as Grievous sees Obi-Wan and Anakin making their way over to where Palpatine was being held prisoner, Grievous would decide to head on over there to see Dooku take on the two Jedi. Grievous had been assigned a different task by Count Dooku, but Grievous couldn't help himself. He wanted to see Dooku destroy mainly Kenobi, who Grievous hated. And so, Grievous leaves the bridge of his ship, the Invisible Hand, and rushes over to the observation chamber of the ship, which is where Chancellor Palpatine was confined. As for Obi-Wan and Anakin, they soon found the Chancellor, and Count Dooku was waiting for them. They then end up fighting, but unlike in the original timeline, here, as the fight began, Grievous would walk in. And Obi-Wan, as soon as this happened, as soon as Grievous appeared, engaged the cyborg general in combat. So Anakin would be left to fight Dooku by himself, just like in the original timeline. And just like in the original timeline, here too, Anakin would be able to deal with Dooku. Why? Well, Dooku wasn't really trying to kill Anakin. According to the novel session of Revenge of the Sith, Palpatine had essentially told Dooku that Anakin was to join them and become a Sith. Also, at this point in the story, when he's fighting Anakin, Dooku believes that the plan is for him, Dooku, to stay a prisoner on Coruscant until the Jedi were eliminated by Palpatine. So, because of all this, in this new timeline as well, Dooku goes easy on Anakin. And as a result, Anakin ends up cutting off Dooku's hands and placing Dooku's head between two lightsabers, one of which was Dooku's own Crimson Saber. As for Obi-Wan, however, here he would not be knocked out by Dooku, because Obi-Wan must be seen with Grievous. This fight between Grievous and Obi-Wan would go similar to how it did in the original timeline. Grievous would take out his four sabers and try to use the Jedi arts that he learned from Count Dooku, but Grievous would fail miserably and Obi-Wan would leave the Cyborg General dismembered and on his back, unable to move. Grievous' defeat here would come easier than it did on Utapau because unlike on Utapau, Grievous wouldn't be able to run away on a wheel bike here. Anyways, as soon as Grievous was dealt with, Obi-Wan would turn his attention to Dooku and Anakin. At this point, Obi-Wan would see Anakin disarm Dooku and hold Dooku's head between two lightsabers. Obi-Wan would then rush over to Anakin and proclaim to Dooku that he is now under arrest. Following this, Anakin would lower the sabers, and the Chosen One's eyes would now fall upon the dismembered Grievous. This would bring a smile on Anakin's face. Looks like you entered the War Master, Anakin would say. I managed to deal with the Apprentice, Anakin. You dealt with the Master, Obi-Wan would say, looking at Count Dooku. Then, following this exchange, the two Jedi would direct their full attention to Palpatine, and Anakin would undo the Supreme Chancellor's restraints. Palpatine would seem very happy to the two Jedi, but in reality, Grievous had just complicated things. A little for Palpatine. But the Sith Lord had of course planned for this scenario. Palpatine had told Dooku that he would be kept safe as a prisoner on Coruscant, till he, Palpatine, dealt with the Jedi through Order 66. So even here, as far as Dooku was concerned, all was going according to plan. And as a result, there was no chance of betrayal from Dooku. As for Grievous, well, he was disposable even at this point. This is evidenced by the novelization of Revenge of the Sith, where after killing Dooku, Palpatine suggests Anakin kill Grievous as well. So Grievous meant nothing to Palpatine. But in this timeline, Grievous is arrested and not killed as Obi-Wan only dismembered and completely immobilized the cyborg, leaving him alive. This would be an unwanted complication, but at the end of the day, Grievous didn't know Palpatine was serious, and so Palpatine did not believe Grievous's capture to be a huge issue. And so, with all that in mind, Palpatine, after being freed, would thank his rescuers, and then the three, with Dooku in cuffs, would make their way over to the bridge of the Invisible Hand leaving Grievous to roll about in the observation chamber. Grievous wasn't going anywhere, Anakin and Obi-Wan figured. Then, soon enough, the two Jedi would reach the bridge of the Invisible Hand, deal with the droids, and then safely pilot the cruiser down to Coruscant. Another happy landing, Obi-Wan would say. Following all this, not much later, many things would happen. Dooku and what was left of Grievous would be transported to the Republic Judiciary Central Detention Center, which was a high-security prison on Coruscant, where the two disarmed generals of the Separatist Army would be kept under tight security. And in the meantime, an emergency session of the Senate would be called to discuss the recent developments. Palpatine, now realizing he needs to justify holding on to his emergency powers, would state, with noticeable regret in his voice, that the war will not end till the Separatist leaders have been captured, the likes of Newt Gunray. 
this most of the Senate would find reasonable. Later, as Sidious, Palpatine would have all these separatist leaders move to Mustafar. Grievous wouldn't be able to keep Uedapau a secret for long. Palpatine knew this. So, to keep these separatist leaders safe, until he has no use for them, Palpatine, or Sidious, has them moved to Mustafar in the Outer Rim. And following this, Palpatine would also directly direct the separatist warfronts. Palpatine does this because he needs to make it look like the Separatist command structure has not been completely destroyed to keep the facade of the war going. And on top of that, Palpatine also needed to keep the Jedi as far away from Coruscant as possible, especially the likes of Yoda. So even here, given the complications that Grievous introduced, all would be proceeding as per Palpatine's designs. As for Anakin Skywalker, the chosen one, after the whole ordeal with Dooku and Grievous, he would meet with Padme, and Padme would tell him that she is pregnant, and Anakin would react the same as he did in the original timeline. And later that night, again like in the original timeline, Anakin would get a vision, and in it he would see Padme dying, but not in childbirth. In fact, Anakin wouldn't be able to figure out what causes her death. All the vision showed Anakin would be Padme, who looked severely injured, gently calling out his name as she dies. Following this, Anakin would share with Padme what he saw, and she will try to assure him that everything will be fine, but Anakin didn't believe her and would begin to look for ways to save his wife from the death he saw. And in this pursuit, Anakin's mind would go to the restricted section of the Jedi archives. The restricted section contained forbidden knowledge on both Jedi and even Sith teachings, but the problem, as Anakin quickly realized, was that the restricted section is only accessible to Jedi Masters, which he was not but Obi-Wan was. So ultimately, Anakin decides to seek Obi-Wan's help. So this, by the way, was Anakin's plan in the original timeline as well, as evidenced by the novelization of Revenge of the Sith. But in the original timeline, before Anakin could have this discussion with Obi-Wan, Obi-Wan was sent to Utapau, so that plan doesn't work out for him there. But let's see what happens here. So around this time, when Anakin was ruminating on his vision, Obi-Wan, along with Mace Windu and Yoda, would be busy interrogating Count Dooku, or Darth Tyrannus. The Jedi Masters would ask Dooku about Darth Sidious. I told you everything I had to say on Geonosis, Obi-Wan. This would be Dooku's response. And since the Masters couldn't probe Dooku's mind like they did with Cad Bane in the Clone Wars, the Masters would move on to Grievous. Grievous would also refuse to talk, but unlike with Dooku, the Masters would be able to force Grievous to speak with the Force. And as a result, the Jedi would learn from Grievous that Sidious is indeed behind the Separatists, and that Uripao was probably where the Separatist leaders were heading out in, because by now, Sidious has probably moved them. Yoda would quickly figure this, but still, battalions of clone troopers would be dispatched to Uripao just to make sure. So basically, in this timeline, Obi-Wan would have no reason to leave Coruscant. Also, the Masters would ask Grievous who Darth Sidious is, but they would quickly find that Grievous has no idea as to the real identity of Darth Sidious. Anyways, the following day, Anakin would make his way over to the temple from Padme's apartment in the Senate District on Coruscant. And once in the temple, Anakin would soon find Obi-Wan. But just like in the original timeline, before Anakin could press in the issue of access in the restricted section of the archives, Obi-Wan would tell Anakin that the Chancellor has requested his presence, forcing Anakin to postpone the talk he had planned with Obi-Wan. As for the information gleaned from Dooku and Grievous, Anakin wouldn't care much, and Obi-Wan would notice it. Something was troubling his former apprentice, Obi-Wan would think, but Obi-Wan would not press Anakin to talk about it. Anyways, shortly thereafter, Anakin would be in Palpatine's office. So Palpatine's intentions here is the same as it was in the original timeline, to drive a wedge between Anakin and the Jedi. So to do this, Palpatine tells Anakin that he is appointing Anakin as the Chancellor's representative of the Jedi Council. This would bring a lot of joy to Anakin because Anakin believes that he will now be made a master, which means he will soon be able to access the restricted section of the Jedi Archives without involving Obi-Wan. But the Council, of course, denies Anakin the rank of master. And then the infuriated Anakin is asked by Obi-Wan for the Council to spy on the Chancellor. As the Council believes something to be out of place with Palpatine, with the Chancellor appearing to be in no mood to give up his emergency powers, and Anakin reluctantly agrees to this request by the Council. Also, like in the original timeline, here too, Yoda goes to Kashyyyk, since at this point, the Jedi Council believe the war to be still going on under Darth Sidious's command. But, unlike in the original timeline, Obi-Wan wouldn't have to go anywhere, as by this point, the close dispatch to Utapau had gone there and discovered nothing of value. 
But again, due to the stressful situation that Anakin was in due to Obi-Wan presenting this request, Anakin is again not able to talk with Obi-Wan about accessing the archives. And on top of that, after speaking with Anakin, Obi-Wan immediately had to get into a shuttle with Mace Windu and Yoda. So later that night, Anakin is invited to the Galaxy's Opera House by Palpatine. Why? Well, like in the original timeline, Palpatine had two things to share with Anakin. One was clone intelligence discovering the Separatist leaders hiding out in the Outer Rim in the Mustafar system. It was time to end the war and destroy the Jedi. This is why Palpatine gives up the leaders of the CIS. And the second thing Palpatine wanted to tell Anakin was the tragedy of Darth Plagueis. About how he could keep the ones he cared about from dying because Palpatine knows that Anakin has had visions of Padme dying. How? Well, because Palpatine or Sidious had visions of the same. He was an extremely powerful force user, so he too had visions of the future. And that, coupled with Palpatine sensing the fear of loss from Anakin, it wouldn't have been hard for the Dark Lord of the Sith to summarize that Anakin too has seen visions of Padme Amidala dying. And also, like mentioned in the novelization for Revenge of the Sith, Palpatine has known for some time now of Anakin and Padme's secret marriage on Naboo. But anyways, due to Palpatine's manipulations here, Anakin comes to believe that the dark side is how he might be able to save Padme. Also, as for why Anakin doesn't question Palpatine's knowledge of the Sith, well that is because Sidious had implied that he's been researching the Sith for a while at this point. This too is mentioned in the novelization. So after the meeting with Palpatine, Anakin would share the possible discovery of the Separatist leaders with the Jedi Council. And immediately following this, clones would be sent to Mustafar and Rukit Fist to destroy the droids there and arrest the Separatist leaders, if they are indeed present on Mustafar. Obi-Wan is not sent to Mustafar for this task because the reason why Kenobi was sent after Grievous was because of his past experience fighting the cyborg general. So to simply arrest the Separatist leaders and deal with some droids, Obi-Wan was not necessary. So when Master Kid Fisto volunteered for this task, the council did not oppose. And following this session of the council, Anakin and Obi-Wan would talk. Unlike in the original timeline, since Obi-Wan is not going anywhere, Anakin would hold off his apology to Obi-Wan for later. As the Chosen One had far more pressing concerns on his mind, he needed Obi-Wan's help with accessing the archives, and they were both finally in a position where Anakin could talk about this with his former master. And so, Anakin would begin. I've been having visions again, Obi-Wan. Like the ones I used to get about my mother before she died, Anakin would say to Obi-Wan. So side note, Obi-Wan did indeed know of Anakin's mother dying. This is detailed in Wild Space by Karen Miller. In the book, Anakin accuses Obi-Wan of being responsible for Shmi's death. She'd be alive if you'd believed in my dreams. She'd be alive if I had freed her. Get away from me, Obi-Wan. Leave me alone. This is what Anakin told Obi-Wan about his mother's death, to which Obi-Wan said the following. I'm sorry, I didn't know Anakin. You didn't dream she was in danger. You didn't dream she'd die. If you had, if you told me. The conversation eventually ends with Anakin essentially realizing that it wasn't Obi-Wan's fault. Anyway, he's coming back to the story, but Anakin speaks of having visions similar to those he had of his mother. It would grab Obi-Wan's attention because he knows what happened the last time he ignored Anakin's visions. What did you see, Anakin? Obi-Wan would ask in a concerned tone. Anakin would take a moment to respond. I saw someone die. Who? Obi-Wan would ask. Anakin wouldn't know what to say. He hadn't prepared for this conversation as well as he believed Anakin would realize at this moment. Had Obi-Wan said this, he didn't need the force to do that. So Obi-Wan would make this easier for his former apprentice. Is it Padme? Obi-Wan asked. Hearing this, Anakin turned around to look at Obi-Wan, not really surprised at Obi-Wan having figured out it was Padme. Obi-Wan, of course, knew Padme and Anakin loved each other, and Anakin knew that Obi-Wan was aware of this. Evidenced again by the double session for Revenge of the Set, both Obi-Wan and Anakin essentially pretended that Obi-Wan didn't know anything for Anakin's sake. But given what Anakin was telling him here, Obi-Wan realized that they needed to stop pretending, at least for now. I saw her, Obi-Wan, she was dying, and if I don't do anything, this vision will come to pass. She will die, just like my mother. Hearing this would leave Obi-Wan extremely concerned, and seeing the concerned Obi-Wan, Anakin would continue. I need your help, Obi-Wan. How can I help Anakin? Obi-Wan would respond. And in the ensuing conversation, Anakin would share with Obi-Wan his belief that the restricted sector of the archives could possess the answer to how Padme can be saved. Obi-Wan would think on this for a moment, and would ultimately say that he will help Anakin with this. Further, Obi-Wan would go on to say that both of them can access the archives together with Jocasta News 
permission. This, by the way, is evidenced by the comic Darth Vader Legacy's End, where an ancient security droid tells Vader, who the droid identified as Anakin, that he, Anakin, can only enter the restricted section with permission from Jocasta Nu. So Obi-Wan is right here. All they need to do now was to convince Jocasta Nu that the Chosen One needs access to the restricted section of the archives along with his master, which would be difficult but not impossible. And so, ultimately, in this alternate timeline, Anakin would find hope in Obi-Wan and the Jedi Order that Padme can be saved. But in the meantime, when Anakin and Obi-Wan were having their discussion, Kid Fisto would discover the Separatist leaders on Mustafar and would engage the few droids stationed on Mustafar. And as soon as this happened, Master Kid Fisto would inform the Council of this, and as a result, Mace Windu would call over Anakin and tell him to go tell the Chancellor that the Separatist leaders have been found. This would be happening not long after Anakin sought Obi-Wan's help, and the only thing on Anakin's mind right now would be getting this information to Palpatine and getting back to the temple so that he and Obi-Wan may begin their work. So Anakin would immediately make his way over to Palpatine's office and tell him that the Separatist leaders have been found and engaged in combat, which was of course the final part of Palpatine's plan. All that needed to be done now was for Palpatine to get the Jedi to attack him and execute Order 66, and also manipulate Anakin in deciding with him. And so, with all that in mind, when Anakin arrived with the information from Mace, Palpatine would reveal his Sith identity to Anakin, telling Anakin that Pathme can be saved only through him, Palpatine, or Sidious. Anakin ignites his saber and considers cutting down Palpatine right then and there, but then Anakin would tell Palpatine that he will be turning Palpatine over to the Jedi Council. Of course you should, Palpatine would say in response. And before Anakin left out the door to the Chancellor's office, Palpatine would add the following. If you choose wrong, Anakin, you will lose her forever. Hearing this, Anakin would stop, turn around, but then walk out the door without saying anything. So soon after this, Anakin would reach the temple and would find Master Windu and Kenobi. They would tell Anakin that they are on their way to the Chancellor's office to make sure that he gives up his emergency powers. Now that that war is over, Anakin would stop the two masters and tell them that Palpatine will not give up his powers because he is the Sith who they have been looking for. Upon hearing Anakin's revelation, Mace Windu's eyes narrowed, a mix of concern and resolve etching his features. Our worst fears have come to pass, he muttered, the pieces of a long and perplexing puzzle finally clicking into place inside Mace Windu's mind. We must act swiftly if the Jedi Order is to survive. Palpatine must be dealt with, Mace Windu would say. So following this, Mace Windu along with Agent Kolar, Stacey Tin, and Shaq Thi in the absence of Kid Fisto prepared to confront Palpatine and deal with him in whatever ways necessary. And similar to the original timeline, Anakin's request to join the Masters would be denied because Mace Windu would sense a great deal of confusion within Anakin. And seeing Anakin's turmoil, Obi-Wan would also choose to stay with his former apprentice in the temple. Also, side note, the reason Obi-Wan would choose to stay back with Anakin would be because it was believed by Yoda and the Council that Mace Windu and Agent Kolar would be best suited to deal with Sidious when he was discovered. And in this timeline, both Kolar and Windu are on their way to confront Sidious, along with Shaq Thi and Stacey Teen, so Obi-Wan would feel as though they will be more than enough to handle Sidious. And so with all that decided, after telling Obi-Wan and Anakin to inform Yoda of this development, the Masters flew away on their shuttle to end the Sith. But just as this happened, Anakin received a transmission on his comlink. Obi-Wan, who was momentarily lost in thought, didn't pay close attention to what the transmission was about. However, its effect on Anakin was hard to ignore. Obi-Wan saw Anakin's face go pale, and then the Chosen One ran to his Peter without saying a word. Puzzled and concerned by this sudden change in his former apprentice's demeanor, Obi-Wan fooled on Anakin, asking what was wrong. Anakin still didn't respond, and Obi-Wan could sense the maelstrom of emotions Anakin was experiencing. Soon after, Obi-Wan was essentially forced to jump into a speeder with Anakin, and the speeder departed the temple with extreme speed. So a short while after this, after Obi-Wan and Anakin left the temple, the Masters, Mace, Kolar, Shakti, and Stacey Tin arrived at the Senate building and made their way into the Chancellor's office. As the confrontation in the Chancellor's office intensified, the Jedi Masters stood ready to carry out their grave task. In the name of the Galactic Senate of the Republic, you are under arrest, Chancellor Mace Windu declared. Are you threatening me, Master Jedi? Palpatine responded. The Senate will decide your fate. I am the Senate. Not yet, Mace Windu replied, his hand gripping his lightsaber. Is treason then? 
Palpatine sneered. Shakti, maintaining her composure, added, Your deception ends now, Sith. Following this, Palpatine took out his crimson saber and launched himself at the Jedi Masters. As the battle began, Palpatine quickly overpowered Ace and Kolar and Sacy Tin. However, Shakti's presence made a significant difference compared to Kit Fisto's. Her fighting style, deeply rooted in her connection with the Force, allowed her to anticipate Palpatine's moves with a precision and grace that Kit Fisto's more direct approach could not match. She countered the Sith Lord's ferocious strikes with fluidity, creating openings for Windu's powerful strikes. Amidst all this chaos, Windu's purple lightsaber connected with the large window behind Palpatine. The window shattered spectacularly, symbolizing the fall of Palpatine's deceitful facade. Seizing the moment, Windu then disarmed Palpatine with a precise kick, sending the Sith's lightsaber out through the broken window into the depths of Coruscant. You have lost, my lord, Miss Windu said, his purple saber at the Chancellor's throat. You underestimate the power of the dark side, Palpatine said, looking at Mace Windu. And the reason Palpatine says this is because at this moment, Palpatine sensed Anakin Skywalker approaching, all was going according to plan. But as Skywalker got closer, Palpatine sensed that the young Jedi was filled with rage and nothing else. Something had happened, something he, Palpatine, had not planned for. Because as Palpatine could sense, Anakin's rage was directed towards him. So to explain why this is happening, let's go back to when Anakin and Obi-Wan sped away from the temple on a speeder. So the transmission that had caused the traumatic reaction in Anakin was from C-3PO. The droid's voice, usually filled with worry, was laden with panic in the transmission. Master Anakin, there's been an explosion in Senator Amidala's apartment. She's been taken to the Grand Republic medical facility. This is what the protocol droid told Anakin. As Anakin and Obi-Wan raced through the bustling Coruscant sky lanes, Anakin's mind was a whirlwind of fear. Obi-Wan, sensing the turmoil within his former apprentice, tried to offer words of comfort, but Anakin was beyond consolation. Arriving at the Grand Republic Medical Facility, Anakin burst through the doors with a singular focus. He had to get to Padme. And soon after, he did, but the sight that greeted him crushed his very soul. Padme, the love of his life, lay still, lifeless. Despite the medical droids' best efforts, she had succumbed to the injuries sustained in the explosion. His vision had come true. He had failed to save her. As Anakin stood in the cold, sterile room of the hospital, his eyes fixed on Padme's lifeless form. The initial shock that had gripped him gave way to an overwhelming grief. His heart, once filled with love and hope, now shattered into a million pieces. Padme, his wife, the woman he loved more than anything, was gone. The medical roads' monotonous beeps and the hushed whispers of the medical staff faded into the background as Anakin's world narrowed down to the devastating sight before him. Memories of their time together flooded Anakin's mind, their sacred wedding on Naboo, the stolen moments they shared, and dreams of a future together. With each memory, his heart ached more intensely. Padme, Anakin's voice was a broken whisper. He fell to his knees beside her, the pain overwhelming. Obi-Wan placed a hand on Anakin's shoulder. Anakin, I'm so sorry, he said softly. Then, like a creeping shadow, anger began to seep into Anakin's mind. She recalled Palpatine's words, words he had initially interpreted as a warning now seemed like a sinister threat. If you choose wrong Anakin, you will lose her forever. In his heart, Anakin now believed Palpatine orchestrated this tragedy as either a punishment for his indecision or a wild attempt to push him towards the dark side. It didn't matter. Palpatine did this, Anakin decided. Following this, fueled by an uncontrollable fury, Anakin left the medical facility, determined to confront Palpatine. Obi-Wan, alarmed by Anakin's volatile state, followed closely. They both then left the medical facility and started making their way towards the Senate building, to Palpatine's office. And this is the reason why Palpatine, as he stood before Mace and Shakti, sensed an angered Anakin coming for him. And sure, Shortly after sensing this, Palpatine deduced that something tragic must have befallen Senator Amidala, and Anakin was holding him, Palpatine, responsible. The intensity of Anakin's rage left no room for doubt in Palpatine's mind. This was the only explanation that made sense, given the circumstances. So, sensing the rapidly escalating situation and realizing that manipulating Anakin against the Jedi would now be difficult, to say the least, Sidious dropped all pretenses. His eyes, cold and glowing yellow, glinted with malevolent intent as he unleashed his full power. Dark energy crackled around him. 
and with a sinister snarl, he hurled a ferocious storm of force lightning at Mace Windu and Shakti. Shakti leapt into action, her lightsaber a blur of motion, as she, along with Mace, deflected Sidious's lightning. The force will not yield to your corruption, Shakti declared. And it is now, as the two masters are holding off Sidious's lightning, that Anakin and Obi-Wan burst into the room. Anakin, fueled by a barrage of emotions, launched at Sidious with an intensity born of grief and betrayal. Obi-Wan, his expression grim, jumped in, understanding the high stakes of this confrontation. Sidious, realizing the futility of directly engaging all four formidable Jedi, shifted his strategy towards escape. The Jedi had now attacked him. He could execute Order 66 now. All he needed was just a little time. So Sidious tries to get away from the four Jedi. Palpatine's mastery of the Force and the dark side was immense, but even he knew that fighting a Jedi master like Mace Windu, the skilled Shock T, a determined Obi-Wan, and a wrathful Anakin was a challenge. However, Palpatine's plans to get away were met with immense resistance. The Jedi were relentless. Shakti and Mace coordinated their attacks to block Sidious's path while Obi-Wan and Anakin pressed forward, cutting off any escape. Sidious's force lightning, though powerful, was not enough to fend off the combined might of all four Jedi. Cornered and desperate at this moment, Sidious resorted to manipulation again his voice dripping with deceit. Anakin, you are being deceived. They want to destroy the Republic, destroy us. They're lying to you. In response, Anakin, pausing briefly, looked at Sidious with a mixture of anger and confusion. The Chancellor's words momentarily conflicted with the swirling chaos of emotions within Anakin, but Obi-Wan's voice quickly broke through the turmoil. Don't listen to him, Anakin. He's trying to manipulate you, he always has. Mace Windu, seizing the moment, added, Anakin, he is the traitor. Don't listen to him. As a response to all this, Palpatine tried to spew more deceitful words, but suddenly the Dark Lord of the Sith felt a strong grip around his neck. It was Anakin, his face twisted with a mixture of grief and fury, choking Palpatine with the strength of the Force. Palpatine gasped for air, his eyes widening in shock. The lightning bolt stopped emanating from Sidious's fingers at this moment, and seizing this opportunity, Shakti moved with the grace and precision of a true Jedi Master, and in one swift motion, a lightsaber, arc through the air, severing Sidious's arms, rendering Sidious's ability of force lightning mute. Master Windu, witnessing this decisive moment, understood the gravity of the situation. He realized that Palpatine, with his deep-rooted influence over the Senate and the courts, posed a threat that extended far beyond this physical confrontation. He was too dangerous to be left alive, Mace Windu realized. The Sith Lord's manipulative reach had to be ended once and for all to save the Republic and the Jedi Order. And so, with a solemn sense of duty and a heavy heart, Mace Windu raised his purple lightsaber. For the Republic, he declared, his voice echoing in the chamber, and then, with a swift strike, he decapitated Sidious. The Sith Lord's head, still bearing an expression of shock, fell through the shattered window, plummeting into the depths of Coruscant's sprawling cityscape. The room then fell silent, the only sounds being the humming of the Jedi lightsabers and the distant noises of the bustling city below. The Jedi stood there, taking in the enormity of what had just happened. And it is only now, after he's been decapitated and his head thrown out a window, that Anakin releases his hold on Sidious's decapitated corpse, following which what was left of Sidious fell to the floor. The Chosen One, having brought balance to the Force, collapsed to his knees. The weight of his actions and the loss of Padme crashing down on him at once. Outside, the city of Corson continued its eternal hum, oblivious to the pivotal moment that had just occurred in the office of the Supreme Chancellor, a moment that would forever alter the course of the galaxy. In the following days, the Jedi, having been instrumental in the fall of the Sith Lord who had manipulated the highest echelons of power, found themselves at a critical juncture. They surrendered themselves to the Senate, ready to face the consequences of their actions, no matter the cost. Defeating the Sith would be worth any punishment, the Jedi knew this. However, the key to vindicating the Jedi lay to a great degree with Count Dooku, who was still being kept as a prisoner on Coruscant. Initially resistant to comply, Dooku was a broken man. His dreams of Sith glory had been shattered. It was during a visit from Master Yoda that the tide began to turn. Yoda appealed to Dooku's sense of honor, reminding him of his days as a Jedi. Once a guardian of peace you were, Dooku. You can be so again, Yoda urged. Yoda would go on to admit to Dooku that mistakes were made by the Jedi. Mistakes that Dooku could now help 
Correct. Eventually, moved by Yoda's words and seeing as how he didn't have much of an after left, if he didn't say anything, the Jedi Masters would be executed, but the Order and the Republic would continue. But if he did help them, the Jedi, which included Anakin and Obi-Wan, would be spared. And so, because of all this, eventually Dooku would agree to testify. His testimony, coupled with Darth Maul's revelations, who by this point had been brought to Coruscant by Ahsoka, and confessions from the captured Separatist leaders, the likes of Noon Gunray, painted a damning picture of Palpatine's treachery. The Senate was eventually forced to accept the truth. Palpatine was the mastermind behind the galaxy's suffering. And following this realization by the Senate and the courts, the Jedi who killed Palpatine would be found not innocent, but set free. They weren't found innocent because, even though Palpatine was guilty, the Jedi did commit extrajudicial execution. This argument would be heavily pushed by Tarkin, but at the end of the day, the Senate and the courts would decide to not punish the Jedi for this. Following this, the arguments made by Fives would be looked into, and eventually Order 66 would be discovered. Following which, under the supervision of Jedi and Republic medical teams, the inhibitor chips would be removed from every single clone trooper. As for Palpatine's accomplices, other than Dooku, the only one that remained would be the Vice Chair of the Galactic Senate, Masa Meta. And so, because of this, Masa Meta would be interrogated and would be tried after being found an accomplice to Palpatine. Meanwhile, Ahsoka Tano, who had faced and defeated Mole, a Sith Lord, decided to rejoin the Jedi Order. And just like Obi-Wan, Ahsoka too would be knighted for defeating a Sith Lord. Also, Ahsoka's decision to stay with the Jedi was not solely for the Order, it was for Anakin. She chose to remain by his side as a pillar of support in his darkest hour. And also, in the end, Anakin was given the rank of Master. But it didn't mean anything to him by this point. He had failed to keep Padme safe from Palpatine. But what Anakin didn't know or failed to realize was that it wasn't Palpatine who killed Padme. So who was responsible for her death? Well, that would be someone who wanted her dead ever since she was basically a child. It was Newt Gunray who pulled the strings on Padme's death. So what happened was that Newt Gunray, as he was cornered and desperate as the clones and circle Mustafar, realized his allies Sidious, Dooku, and Grievous had failed him and the other Separatist leaders. Faced with imminent capture and likely execution or lifelong imprisonment, Gunray acted on a deep-seated grudge that had been festering since the blockade of Naboo. And this grudge was, of course, against Padme. Gunray had tried to kill her during the blockade of Naboo, and when that failed, he tried again during the events of Attack of the Clones, which too had failed. But now, determined to have his final revenge, and with nothing left to lose, Newt Gunray employed an elite group of independent Mandalorian mercenaries to assassinate Senator Padme Amidala on Coruscant. Credits by this point were of course no issue to Gunray. Soon he would never be able to access them. But at this moment, he had access to vast quantities of wealth. So he used that to enact his revenge. These Mandalorians, which were distinct from those involved in the Siege of Mandalore, were notorious for their skill and unyielding loyalty to their contract. Their professionalism ensured that the true instigator of the hit, Newt Gunray, would remain obscured. They executed their mission on Coruscant with lethal precision, leading to the tragic death of Padme. This is what Anakin saw in his vision. As for Gunray, following his capture, he was put on trial for his pivotal role in the Separatist movement and the countless deaths resulting from the Clone Wars. His trial was a significant event, marking the Republic's efforts to bring those responsible for the war to justice. Gunray was eventually found guilty of numerous war crimes and atrocities cities, reflecting the immense suffering he had helped cause across the galaxy. But still, Gunray's involvement in the assassination of Padme was never revealed. As a result, Gunray's sentence, though severe, was based solely on the enormity of his crimes during the war. As part of his sentence, Gunray was condemned to life in prison. Death would have been far too easy of a punishment. Gunray's sentence had also stipulated that he would never again see daylight, confined perpetually to a high-security cell. And so, in the end, Newt Gunray, for all his crimes proven and unproven, he would rot away in a prison cell. But I suppose by killing Pathme, Newt Gunray ensured the downfall of Sidious. So in a way, he saved the galaxy too, I guess. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you got the time and feel like helping out the channel, do check out my Patreon, where for $1 or more a month, you'll get early access to videos and access to exclusive content that wouldn't be seen on the channel for months. Link is in the description, so if you got the time, do consider checking it out. So goodbye, have a good day, and stay hydrated.